So welcome everybody to the um, to the meet and greet session for the University of Washington Math Department. All of you have been invited because you're on the wait list, which means we love, love, love your application. But unfortunately, we have very limited funding. It seems like it's worse this year than it was in the past, and that's partly due to COVID. Um, several people who are here in our PhD program right now got their process delayed a little bit. So people are not graduating at quite the rate that we usually do. And last year, um, we did a great job with recruiting and got a few more people than expected. So uh, that means we're going to have a, a sort of smaller class this year. It won't be too small, though. Um, it's still, we're a big school. It'll hopefully be around 15 people. And uh, that'll be enough that you'll get to know everybody but it'll be cozy and intimate. I, so I think it's going to be great, but I know you're all waiting to hear what's going to happen with us. So I wanted to give you an update on that first of all, where we are in the admissions process. And then I thought what we're going to have to do is um, when and if you get an offer, um, we'll have to move quickly. So I wanted to run through some of the highlights of the program to tell you a little bit of information so that you're prepared to make a, a, a decision on a short-term basis, okay? Uh, so let, let's start with the where are we in the process. So we sent out our um, admissions uh, about the day before I sent you an email. Uh, people have been sitting on their acceptances for quite some time. I have heard from about 10 of the people that we sent admits to. We have two who accepted so far. Um, nine of them have told us they're not coming and we are still waiting to hear from quite a few more. Um, what I'm thinking is that around April 4th, I'm going to reevaluate how many admissions we've done. So you probably won't hear from me this coming week, but around April 4th, I will try and give you another update. And then from there, we'll just keep updating. But I know in the past that sometimes it's come down to April 10th, and in some cases, it's actually come down to April 15th. So, you know, I'll keep you posted as soon as I know that there's a spot for you, okay? And vice versa, if you make a decision you want to go somewhere else, you know, if you give me a heads up that you've you've already made your decision and you want to withdraw, I totally understand because, the, you know, we're all on pins and needles during this process. I know, you, I know I'm on pins and needles. It's a bit of a gambling game on my end, but I, I know how it feels for you guys too. Um, so any questions on that? Is there any more information I should provide? because I know that's a, probably the most important question. Okay. Well, as we go through this little spiel, I was gonna give you my recruiting spiel so that uh, I know I'm, I'm, it's a little bit awkward timing, right? Because if I'm recruiting too much and you don't get an offer, it's gonna be a little uncomfortable, but I do want you to have the information so that you can make an informed decision when the time comes. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen share. So now I think that you can see my screen. Is that correct? And I have a slide that says University of Washington. All right. And I see Stefan Steinerberger just showed up as a faculty member. So thanks very much, Stefan, for showing up. I'm sorry I didn't get you on this list. But Alice Boyd's um, Christine Hampton, are you here? Maybe Christine is not here yet. She said she was coming. Um, Zhenqing Meng is here. She's a student in our department. She's waving. And Kevin Liu is here. He's a student in our department. So I'll go through my spiel and then let me introduce each and every one of those people to you and they'll have a chance to say something towards the end. Okay, so this is about the University of Washington's math department. Just to clarify this, we are different than the applied math department. And we're also different than the statistics department. So as I go through these numbers, this really does not include all the mathematicians on campus. It's a bigger group than that, but for some reason, historically, we got broken up like this, and we just live with it. Um, I would actually love to be merged with all of them, and I especially like the applied math people, but unfortunately, they're in a different building, so I don't see them all that often. All right. So... Okay, so what do we have in our math department? We have about 60 faculty members and about 85 PhD students. We have a huge number of undergraduates. We have um, 
depending on how you count, around a, a thousand undergrad math majors. That's technically an overestimate though, because it's really more like 650. But the thing is that we don't always count people until they're in the major, you know, so you're not counting the freshmen. So it's a, it's a really big group um, and it's a competitive major. So when you are teaching the upper level classes, everybody who's in there has gone through an admissions process themselves. And I find that that means the students are really good. The undergrads are very good and they're engaged and they're interested in their classes. Now in calculus, you're gonna have a variety of people that you'll teach, you know, some wanna be in calculus and some don't, but um, generally I'm very impressed with the quality of the students that we get. And as you can see in this slide, you know, we've done a lot of things on Zoom over the last couple of years. So quite a few animals in the department these days, kids, pets, dogs, all kinds of things appear in Zoom videos. Um, what areas of research do we do? We do a lot of things. We're a pretty big department. We don't do everything. Um, you guys have been selected partly because the areas of interest that you expressed did match well with what we do. But we do algebra, a non commutative algebra, algebraic geometry, algebraic um, combinatorics, and geometric combinatorics. Sometimes people do both of those. Complex analysis, discrete geometry, differential geometry, dynamical systems, ergodic theory, geometric measure theory, math physics, non smooth analysis is really big, number theory, very active group, um, numerical analysis, optimization is huge. We have a lot of great people in that. PDEs and inverse problems. I don't know if you've heard of Gunther Ullman, but he's one of our more famous faculty members. He's famous particularly right now because he has a mathematical theory of cloaking like Harry Potter, which is actually viable and people are implementing it in chemistry and physics and also in biology is with cancer screening, um, trying to protect certain organs from the radiation. It's really neat. Um, PDEs and inverse problems. That's what he does. And then probability and representation theory. So hopefully some of that speaks to you. Um, the highlights of our department are, I think, I think one of the best things about our department is that we have a really active research environment. I mean, that's what you're trying to get in the PhD program, right? You're, it's, it's partly about the classes, but your classes will peter out pretty soon, a couple years. It's really about making some new mathematics, and it is much easier to do that if you're in a community of people who are also working on creating new math and excited about that kind of new math. So we, we foster that by having different seminars and colloquia. We have international visitors in the past. Uh, during COVID times, the visitors have really not been around as much, um, except that they, they, there have still been some visitors even in COVID times. Um, but I like that because that's a way for you to get to meet other people in the field who are in your area. You know, if you have people coming, let's say I, I have a good collaborator who comes from Slovenia, We've definitely had a lot of people come from China. We have people coming from France often. You know, they, it's a, it's a, it gives you another perspective on the same math, but from a different point of view. And an important part of our research environment is that we provide funding for our students to travel to conferences outside the, the University of Washington. So we give about $750 per year to each student if they want to, to go to a conference. And that's maybe if you're going to give a talk, that's really important. Even if you're not going to give a talk, it's really important to go make those connections and hear what's important in the research. Same thing with the seminars. That's why we want, we want to continue that. Um, almost all of our TAs are, sorry, almost all of our PhD students are supported by TAs. We do have some people with NSF fellowships and, um, and various other research assistantships that if you get a research assistantship, that's usually through your advisor. It's not something we set up in advance. It's something that kind of organically happens. Um, when we do offer a TA ship to people, we, we expect to give them five years of funding. Um, you may get a sixth year, especially if your thesis is going well, but you just need one more year. That happens pretty often. And occasionally we even have a seventh year. I have one person in mind. I know he, he got sick, he got diabetes, and you know it sort of slowed down his program, so he got a seventh year of funding. It's a pretty compassionate, limit at the end, but you do have to show progress, you know, to continue to get funding. Um, the TAs, when they first come, you'll be invited, actually mandatory TA training, where we talk about what we're expecting for calculus classes, linear algebra, differential equations, things like that, and how to use the software that we use. Um, 
we're in the middle of trying to revamp that and the TA guide to, to include a little bit more about how to be a good mathematician, not just be a TA. Uh, so that's in progress. I don't know if it'll be ready for September, but at least parts of it will be. You know, that, that's kind of all encompassing. We're, it's always hard to find the right advice for everybody who might come along, but we're, we're gonna give it a try and up, update it. Uh, an important part of our department is we encourage collaboration between the students, between the students and the faculty, between the students, faculty, and postdocs, uh, all kinds of things. So we expect that you'll be collaborating on your homework, but also when it comes time to write papers, that's encouraged to write papers with people. Um, I personally, when I got tenure, the thing that I decided is I will never write another single author paper again. I don't really enjoy it nearly as much, and I think the work comes out better when I have collaborators. So, so that's, that's kind of part of the philosophy. And um, finally on this slide, I think it's important to mention that the graduate students in our department have a voice. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that comes into play. But one of them that's built into the system is every year faculty propose some new classes that they might want to teach. You know, we're, at, we're working at the cutting edge of research and things are always changing. And so we teach the usual standard classes, manifolds and algebra and real analysis. But every year we also think about what would be a new interesting subject to teach this year. And we put in proposals. And I just proposed that I'm gonna teach um, positroid varieties and cluster algebras, for example. It's something that you might not have heard of. You may have heard of it if it's related to your research, but something completely new. And um, then the proposals that the faculty put in go to the graduate students and they vote on which ones they'd like to see most or which ones they would like to attend and if the class gets enough votes, then the class runs. If it doesn't get enough votes, it's canceled. It's canceled in advance, like nine months in advance, so people know and can adjust their teaching schedule. But that's that's the way the, vote, the graduate students get input on the classes. Of course, you can always talk to a faculty member and say, hey, would you propose a class on this subject? You know, you have that input too, but that's kind of one-on-one -on -one as opposed to institutionalized voices. We also have a graduate student representative who is um, a student who's elected every year and goes to the department meetings and also sits on the graduate student committee. And that's to have representation and remind the faculty of what it's like to be a graduate student in case anybody forgot, things like that. All right, so here are some of these, those special topics classes. Maybe this is, I should describe this as, here are some of the classes we are teaching this year. So enumerative combinatorics was that's something I taught in the fall. Isabel Novick's teaching polytopes right now, and then Ricky Liu is teaching uh, algebraic combinatorics in the spring. We also have algebraic topology, Gaussian free fields, non-Archimedean geometry, geometry of flag varieties, optimal transport. Shamik Powell has been teaching that, and I don't know if you've heard about that. That's a very hot subject at the moment. Measure theory, scheme theory, uh, non-Archimedean geometry, Algebraic groups, self-organized criticality. Actually, I don't know what that means, so I hope somebody will tell me. Linear algebra, complex manifolds, semi-classical analysis, convex algebraic geometry, non-commutative algebra, model theory, and linear algebra, in addition to the classics that we run every year. So there's lots of good stuff coming. Sometimes when you're, if you come here, you may see a class is offered your first year. Uh, I highly recommend you jump on it if it looks really interesting and squeeze it into your schedule because these things come and go. It might not be offered again for several years. Okay, so um, another really important thing that you're probably interested in is not just getting into grad school, but finishing your PhD. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that our success rate right now is about 80%. Um, that means that looking, you know, it's always hard to count because people are in the middle of the program. But about 10 years ago, if you look back at how many people who entered around 10 years ago and who have already finished or left the program, there's nobody left as a 10 year long PhD student. So everybody has left the program one way or another, then 80% of them finish with their PhD. And that's really good. It's never gonna be 100% because this is a long haul. Getting a PhD is a lot more than running a marathon. And there's always gonna be some people who change their mind and decide they wanna go I know somebody who decided you want to go write novels. And you know, other people do other things, especially when the job market is so good, right? People are getting jobs and, and moving into their career early sometimes. 
But um, compared to the national average, which is about 50%, did you know that, that about 50% of people who enter a PhD program in math finish? We're doing really quite well. And of course, we're always trying to improve it. But like I said, I also want to be tolerant for the fact that sometimes people change their mind. So, so we're trying to ride that curve. And, and right now, I think 80% is pretty good. Um, what happens to our students when they finish with their PhD? They go on to great jobs. People get jobs in academia and in industry and in places that you've heard of. Um, every year we have people come back and tell us what they're up to. So we're going to have an industrial panel at the end of April where people are, four of our students are going to come talk to us about how they got to the jobs that they're in. <clears throat> one is at Amazon, one is at Uber, one is at Chevron, and the fourth one is at the Pacific Northwest National Labs, which is a government job. And I try to run those um, panels every year with a different variety of people and different kinds of jobs to just, just sort of say, what can you do with a math degree? Because, you know, sometimes, especially when I, I don't know about you, but when I was first starting graduate school, I had little blinders on, you know, I didn't know that much about what you could do with a math degree. I was just going to go be a professor. And I think it's been fascinating hearing all the things that people do. If you want to see one of those, there is a, one of them on my YouTube channel, and I can add a link to that for you. That's the, the one from last year. And, um, you know, get what you can out of it. But I think it's really nice to have our own students come back and tell us what they're doing, because they know exactly what, hap you know, what happened in the program for them and how it connects to where they are now. All right, uh, another really nice feature about graduate school here in the University of Washington is that it's located in right in the heart of Seattle, Washington, which is a great city. Um, here's a picture on the left of our university. It's a very pretty campus. And we are located on a lovely piece of land that's surrounded by water almost. And sort of on three sides, we have the Portage Bay on one side and Lake Union on the other side. And just beyond those, if you look out in the distance, you see big mountains with snow-capped snow -capped mountains out there. In fact, from my office, I can see Mount Rainier. It's 14,410 feet tall. It's uh, one of the tallest mountains in the country. It's not something you just go hike on. You just hike to the top easily. If you ever did want to go to the top, you, it's a big deal, and you have to go with a guide, and people die along the way, so you have to be careful. But you can hike around the base of Mount Rainier, and that's accessible to all of us regular hikers, and it's just gorgeous to go to the national parks and take advantage of that if you can. Um, the city itself is very nice. Uh, we've been through some tough times lately. I have to admit, COVID has not been kind to Seattle. I don't know if that's true everywhere. Um, so you might hear about things that have changed. Uh, we do have quite a bit of homelessness, and that's leading to some issues downtown. Uh, but it seems to be, you know, something we're working on. That's just being honest about the situation. Um, transportation is something that works out really nicely on campus, though we have a new light rail. It, it, come, it stops in two places on campus, and that's been great to help students to connect to a bunch of different neighborhoods to live in. So you don't have to live within walking distance of campus. A lot of people take the light rail or a bike or walk, um, and you can take the light rail all the way to the airport. So if, for example, you come to visit, that's the best way to get here from the airport. Also on campus, you know, the University of Washington is a very big school. We have about 40,000 students in total. We're a Division I uh, school in terms of sports. So if you like football or basketball, or I like to go to the volleyball games. The teams are fantastic. But it also means that we have a lot of resources for students. There's over a thousand clubs if you're interested. And of course, we have the things that, you know, if, if life gets a little complex, you know, you have resources for that too. So there's definitely counseling available. Um, the Q Center is a wonderful place for people who are in the LGBTQ community. Um, diversity is something that's important to the University of Washington. I wish it was better, but it is what it is. Um, we're definitely working on it. There are graduate programs specifically for graduate students like yourself, so I put a link on here for um, places you can look for support for graduate students. Uh, equity, inclusion, diversity, and race. So these are just some links for things that might be important to you to check out. Um, I mentioned this too, that uh, a lot of people walk, bike, or take the light rail to campus or the buses. But actually, it goes beyond that. Um, the University of Washington is very environmentally friendly. 
So for example, if you come here, all of Seattle has three kinds of garbage. You have your regular garbage, you have your recycling, and then you have compost. And so every restaurant that you go to, you have to always sit there and think about it. Which garbage am I going to use? But the, the composting program is really huge here. It actually took 80% of the waste out of the landfills and is getting composted and then used and just amazing. I, I've actually been studying garbage in Seattle as part of a side project. And it's fascinating what they're doing these days. Um, so also University of Washington is very bicycle friendly. We have a bike path that goes by the campus. It's 17 miles long. That's the Burke Kilman Trail. Pretty flat. It's a rail, it's a form of rail line. But then if you're interested in biking, there are lots and lots of biking options around here. There are like 30 mile bike rides you can go without leaving the city and feel like you're in a park the whole time. And, and I linked on here uh, something for the UW sustainability efforts if you're interested in that. Okay, and then um, in terms of recruiting, uh, there's lots of, gosh, these days there's so many videos, video tours of Seattle, video tours of campus, all kinds of things that might be useful. Um, Jack Lee is a colleague of ours, and he has been putting together a list of fun things to do in Seattle for like the last 20 years, and I got him to up, update it a little bit last year, so it's pretty current. And um, tons of things, if you were to come visit, you might want to look there for um things that you can do around campus. And I have been taking a bunch of pictures and I made a little photo collection too, so you can you can look at those, see how pretty the, the university is. I, I just wanted to point out a couple of statistics that I kind of found interesting. I actually can't stand it when people um, come to me and they tell me they want to apply only to schools in the US News World Report's top 10 list, because I think that that list is not necessarily the best for everyone, but when we're at the top of it, I always think it's worth pointing out. So it's being a little hypocritical, but did you know that the state of Washington is rated number one this year in US News and World Reports? We are the number one state. I don't know how they measure that, but I, I just put the link there. And um, University of Washington is doing very well in US News and World Reports in the global universities category. We are considered number seven and um, so that's fantastic. Oddly enough, we're lower than that if you look at the universities inside the United States. So I don't know how it is that we could be so high globally and lower in the United States, but whatever. You know, it depends on the, the model that they have and the different ranking system and the weights. So you can take that for what it's worth for you. All right. So now I want to um, switch over and I'm going to introduce Alice Boyd's. Uh, if Sylvia came, I'd like to introduce her. Uh, she said she was going to join, if she can, from the airport in Montana. Uh, Zaicheng Meng, Christine Hampton, if she's here, Stefan Steinerbrenner, and Kevin Liu. And then I'm going to put this um, document in the chat so you can download it and have it as a resource for yourself. And if you'd like, you can cut out this picture and make yourself a custom branded UW logo dodecahedron. That's, that's your swag for today. Okay, so let me let me switch this and we're going to switch over to introductions. Okay. And Alice, do you want to go first? Sure. So I'm Alice Boyds. I work in the Student Services and Advising Office and I've been here since 2016. It's a fabulous place to work. I love coming to work every day. The faculty are delightful people. The graduate students are delightful people. The undergraduate students, not always delightful, but um, I, that, it's a great place to work. And so if you come here, you'll feel comfortable and it's a beautiful campus. That's awesome, thank you. And uh, Zaiting, do you wanna go next? Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Xiang Chenmo. So I'm a fifth year PhD student, and my research area is in probability theory and PDEs. So uh, it's very lovely to live in Seattle, like for up to like, right now five years. And, you know, there are so many activities that you can do. And also, the math people here are really, really friendly. And then you 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 don't have be worried about you know the prelim and stuff because you have a a group of people to, you, that you can have fun with and talk to yeah it's really relaxing 
That's great. I have to say, you're the first person who's ever described the prelim pro process as relaxing. So I'm going <laughs> to quote you on that. <laughs> That's great. Okay. And um, uh, by the way, I think uh, we, uh, Christy and I, are going to hold the uh, uh, in person and virtual panels. So uh, whoever welcome, no, quite sure included, right? Uh, whoever want to visit and then. We will have fun like um, on April, at the beginning of April. Right. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. Next up is um, Stefan. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hello. I'm uh, Stefan Steinerberger. I work in analysis, broadly interpreted. So, integral science and LP spaces and some PDEs, you know, fun stuff like that. Uh, okay. So, since, okay. The way I went to graduate school, you know, you're facing sort of complicated decisions, right? It's hard to know what to do. The way I did it was completely wrong. It's actually completely insane what I did back then. Uh, I can't even say it out aloud because it's been recorded. If you come and you ever ask me, I'll tell you, and you will not believe it. I, anyway, so here's my advice for you. Number one, come here if possible, of course. Uh, number two, why should you come here? <laughs> Uh, the reason is very simple. Some of you may already know exactly what you want to do, right down to the smallest detail, right? I want to work in this mathematical subfield. And then if you apply to Seattle, chances are it's because we have representation in the field. If you don't know what you want to do, it's really good to be in a department that's big and offers a lot of different mathematics because math is, you know, it's fun to begin with, but it gets more fun if you work on stuff you really, really like. And I think the best thing about graduate school is finding out, you know, math is sort of awesome in general. I think they We'll all agree on this, but then there's always certain things that you know, they even a little bit better. And if you find something that, that you really, really like, then graduate school is really fun because you get to do what you want to do all day long. I mean, it's really a great time. Okay, and Seattle is also lovely people. I've been saying this, and the department's very friendly. Okay, that's it from me. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to send me an email. Great. Many other people. I have to agree. I thought graduate school was some of the best days of my life. Yeah. Really great. All right. And then Kevin, can you introduce yourself too? Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a third year. Uh, Sarah is my advisor, so I do combinatorics. Uh, I also remember uh, that three ish years ago, uh, I got off the wait list on April 14th. So uh, feel for y'all in your position right now. Uh, but also, don't use this as a measure of like how good of a mathematician you are. Uh, because I'd say things are going pretty well for me. Uh, and I guess second year during the COVID times was a little hard, but third year has been really nice. That is absolutely true. Kevin's working on his third paper already, so it's going excellent for him. <laughs> it's been great working with him. Um, okay, so was there anybody else who I'm supposed to introduce here from our department? I don't think so. Is that correct? speak up if i've forgotten somebody okay good well then what i would like to do is turn um, it over to yeah i think kristen has some problem with um with her throat like she can't really talk that much i think that's why she didn't that's oh fine. yeah okay thanks okay so good. this morning yeah okay well i hope she's okay but no worries but what i would like to do then is to open it up to questions from the floor so um what would people, what do people want to hear about? Ask us anything you like. We're here as a team to answer your questions. Uh, I have a question. So for people who are supported through TA funding, is the salary distributed monthly? Uh, twice a month, actually. I think it's on the 15th and the 25th or the 10th and the 25th. Correct me if I'm wrong. I... 10th and 25th. 10th and the 25th. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one thing to keep in mind when you move here, um, you don't get a check until after you've been here for a little while. So people do ha struggle a little bit financially because, you know, you got to the moving process can be hard. So if there's extreme need, um, you know, we do have sympathy with that. And we have some extra funds for low income people who might need help with the move. And just to follow up on that, is, is it distributed every month or are there like particular months during the year in which they are distributed? 
Oh, good point. Yes. So um, our TA positions are considered nine month academic placements. Mm -hmm. So when we say we guarantee five years of funding, we mean only nine months a year. Um, then the first year is generally guaranteed the first summer after your first year, you're generally guaranteed to be able to get a TA position for the summer. So that would give you two extra months of salary, but there is one month that's not covered. This is kind of a standard in the industry. Um, everywhere I've been anyway, you kind of, there's sort of somehow academics are expected to have some time off. So you do have to plan for that in terms of your budget. Um, yeah, and then after your first summer, like after your second year and so on, then you could request a TA ship if you would like it. Some people will go to internships. Uh, generally, people do get a TA assignment if they want it. We have a fairly large demand from the undergrad population to cover courses in the summer, and that's a good time for students to teach their own class. Um, students, will you guys chime in here? Have you had any trouble getting summer funding? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I've not had problems at summer fun. It, if anything, it seems like they, they might be a little short on people because uh, I think they're canceling several summer classes, like several sections, because they just don't have enough people, which is a weird situation. They don't have enough people to teach. I mean, they got enough students, but not enough to teach. Right, right. I, I got assigned something and on the list, there were a lot of other classes that said cancel. Yeah, normally for the TA, you need to fill in a preference form that which course you want to teach or you, who want you want to, uh, which professor you want to TA with. But um, yeah, in the summer, it's not guaranteed. But for me, uh, I never get the problem. Like, yeah, I think the summer is very enough yeah, to fund everything. Great, great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and just to confirm the um, mostly people don't teach during the summer, during their first year, like after, right after their first year, but they could usually get it after their second year. Is that correct? The other way around, actually. We, we actually want you to teach the summer after your first year because we also hold prelim prep classes that summer and the, pre the prelims are offered in September. So we really want to encourage people to stick around that summer between their first year and their second year and be part of the community that's doing prelim prep. Oh, I'm, I'm, not sure have, done. I, I, I'm not sure if uh, I misunderstood the question or not. I, Jerry, were you asking like, do we, do we teach our own classes after first year? Uh, no, just in general, like when, when are people able to get funding during summers? Oh yeah. Uh, after first year you are, you do usually get an assignment during the summer, like you're guaranteed one and you should probably get one. It's pretty much like every summer there is usually a chance to get funding as well yes uh also i'm not like as a heads up uh usually the summer pay is a little more than the rest of the year it's not enough to make up like one entire that entire 12 month salary it might be something like half or so and also it depends on who you're working with sometimes um the professors has the re RA ship. So in the summer, you probably have a very good chance to get the RA. So you don't need to actually teach. Yeah, yeah oh, that yeah. very much depends on your 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 specific advisor and their, their funding situation, yeah. Okay, so Eric asks, asks a good question. What are some of the current topics being researched within mathematical physics? Stefan, do you wanna answer that or should I try? Uh, I, can, I can try first round. So uh, mathematical physics, uh, in, to me, always comes in two flavors, the one I understand and the one I don't. Uh, so the one I don't, uh, it tends to be centered around uh, algebraic geometry, you know, quantum field theory, topological aspects. So there's, an, there's a very large and very active group in algebraic geometry that, that certainly touches on these topics. Um, certainly, whenever you do PDE, see if, there, if, this, if this is the one you mean, that there is a fair number of people. Uh, the other one that's usually denoted mathematical physics comes to from sort of more classical PDE problems. And there's a couple of people working on that as well. So, my recent work in this area has been on uh, predicting localization of, of low frequency eigenstates in very chaotic environments, which is then relevant for semiconductor physics. Um, 
Uh, Gunter Ullmann has been mentioned in terms of uh, cloaking, inverse problems, reconstructing, for example, reconstructing the, in, you know, the interior of the Earth from earthquake propagation patterns. That's pretty awesome. You know, you use earthquakes as a way of X-raying the planet. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, so in any time you do partial differential equations, this, this comes up. Uh, if, if you think of the uh, lines of quantum chaos, right, sort of a fundamental theorem, fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics, that would be Hart Smith. Who's one of the experts on uh, Laplace and eigenfunctions, semi classical methods? There's also Alexis Duo, who cares about vortices, pro the propagation of vortices, and sort of Ginsburg Landau type things, although I might be misquoting this. Um, there's probably a couple more people who are currently forgetting. That would be my first draft of an answer. So there's mm -hmm. plenty of math. I, 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 sorry, I forgot the entire applied math department, which is gigantic in terms of uh, people working on mathematical physics and they're very friendly and very smart and very interesting to talk to. So that greatly enhances the scope even more. Yeah, that's great. And in case it comes up, you could have a PhD advisor in applied math, even if you're a pure math and vice versa. We have crossover, no problem. And a lot of people have members of the applied math committee, um, department be on their thesis committee and such. They have, right, they have wave, they have like a very strong special reaction, like wave equations, wave propagation. They have an entire seminar that's dedicated to wave equations, wave like equations. So it's a very active group as well. Right. Bernard DeConnick. Yeah. Great. Does, Eric, did that take care of that question? Or did you have some other kind of mathematical physics in mind? Oh, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Anybody next? Could I ask another teaching related question? Yeah. Um, what classes do the like first year, second year PhD students usually TA for? Is it mostly like calculus or a little above and below calculus or what, what, what topics? Uh, I could try and take this. Sure. So uh, essentially all the first years get some version of calculus, like Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3. Uh, and then the second years usually get pre-calculus or uh, what's essentially college algebra. Uh, and also uh, we have this place called the Math Study Center. It's just a place where undergraduates go to get math help. Uh, a lot of second years get assigned there too. Uh, so for first and second years, that's usually what happens. And then actually, if you're interested in teaching, you can, um, after you sort of prove yourself, if you're really excited and doing a good job, you can ask to teach, be, you know, sort of be the professor, be the instructor in charge as well. It's a nice opportunity for students who, who want to try out academia. Does that usually happen um, in the third year then? Or, can, or what time frame does that typically happen where you request instructor record? Kevin or Shen you want to answer that? Uh, I, I don't quite get your question. You mean the be the uh the main uh instructor of the calculus? Yeah. So yeah, um, normally it happens like in the summer. Uh, yeah, they will have the main instructor, uh, to taking care of the whole uh mass uh one, uh calculus class, calculus one, calculus two. Yeah, and then they will just be the coordinates, something like that, yeah. And Kevin, I you taught math, math 381, the discrete math modeling class, right, last summer? Oh, I, I TA'd for that the year before, but I taught uh, linear optimization 407 last summer. The feeling I get is they try and get you to teach your own course the summer after second year, uh, if that's what you want and you seem like you would do a good job. And then from there, you can keep requesting. Now, I suspect you're all going to do a really good job because uh, you have teaching experience. It seemed like people were interested in that. So that's, I think, something that's really characterized this particular round of applications that a lot of people had more teaching experience than I've seen before. Teaching experience, community building experience, research experience, gosh, the applications were all so strong. All right, anything else we should address? Um, what's the usual time commitment for teaching, like per week? Well, there's a hard and fast rule. It's not supposed to be more than 20 hours as negotiated by the union. 
but um, students should speak up about what's a more typical assignment. Uh, I would say that, uh, first off, my numbers might not be exactly right because I actually taught high school before coming back. And so I'm a bit faster at things like grading. Uh, but I would say on an average week, uh, teaching and holding office hours and so forth is probably somewhere between uh, like eight or to 10 hours. On weeks where there's grading, grading usually takes me maybe three or four hours. Uh, but that happens maybe like two or three times a quarter. Yeah, because uh, in like starting from the third year, you, you will you will be eligible to teach like the 300 level courses and each kind of this course will be held like um, 50 minutes for three times a week. And then you need to get time to prepare it. And after that, you need to hold another additional like two office hours. So I think it would be like eight to 10 hours, but depend on how you get familiar with that topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there is some, a little bit of extra work the first time, especially. So if you haven't, if you haven't done calculus in a while, you might have to catch up a little bit. Uh, the first time I did linear optimization, I spent a little more to get, to make sure everything was like just right. Uh, but I'm doing it again this summer, which will hopefully be a much easier, or at least a bit less time consuming. Yeah, if you're teaching your own course, that probably does make a big difference. You got to think about what material you're going to present. It's just the preparation is whole is a whole different level. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have a question. I was kind of curious if you could speak a little bit to like work life balance and what that means for like the department and the grad students and like how folks picture it. Well, who's the right one to take that question? <laughs> so, you know, it's a challenge. Being a mathematician is a, is a wonderful and interesting, but all consuming job. And, um, you know, I think the first year, the first year students are often, you know, say, oh, we're so stressed. We've got homework and there's so many demands on us, but then they go to spring break and they're completely relieved of their duties, right? Or, you know, the gap in, for, um, between fall and winter, they're completely relieved of any requirements. I'm afraid once you become a real mathematician working on research, your job is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never stops, right? And so it's a really good question how to find a good life balance for that. I think a lot of people in our department have hobbies and interests, you know, that are outside of math. And I appreciate that and embrace it and encourage it because um, you cannot do math seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That would not be healthy in the long run. Like I said, getting a PhD is more than a marathon. You do have to pace yourself and you do have to meet somebody outside the department every once in a while, <laughs> some human interaction outside the department. So I think there's time for, for life balance, but unfortunately it's really going to be left to you as the director of your own program to figure that out. And, and probably we should have more discussions about it, right? During COVID times, especially, I think we've all been a little isolated and wondering exactly how should we be spending our time? But that's something that if you wanted to like, to have a group discussion, one thing you could do is propose a brown bag seminar, which anybody can propose a brown bag seminar on any topic they want and say on Thursday at lunchtime, we're going to meet in the lounge and we're going to talk about work life balance and see what people come up with. Now, I'd love it if, to hear everybody else's answer to that question too. Stefan, how about you? How was your work life balance? Okay, then I'm going to, how about this? If you find the kind of math you like a lot, it's not actually work. So my entire life, I was, I was sort of trying to find a, a way that I wouldn't have to work because it's sort of exhausting to work, right? And like, I remember in high school, like Saturday afternoon, right? You're already sort of angry because Sunday's coming around and then Monday, then you have to go back to school. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Anyway, so I tried to like escape the summer, like counting the days to the weekend. And uh, so I think math, it can be a lot of fun. And if you do it right, it's not actually work. But I think Sarah's completely right. At some point you get tired. And in my experience, you know, the days where you put in 10 hours, they can be extremely productive, but then you're tired the next day and you don't get as much done. And if you were to do four hours each day in a productive manner, right, maybe much more would happen. 
I think this depends very much on the individual. I don't think there's any departmental wide policy on how people spend their time. My advice for all of you is, you know, try to avoid work, make, make fun stuff your job, then you don't have to work. Work for me. That is a very valid point. It's partly your attitude, right? If you can make the job fun, no matter what job you have, it goes better. Yeah. Kevin, what about you? What's your work-life balance like? Uh, I can, I guess, before that, speak to some things I've seen or experienced as a graduate student. Uh, first year, a uh, very poor work-life balance. Uh, I didn't come in with the strongest background, having done math education as an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, very poor work-life balance. It was actually just just work, no life, uh, or balance. Uh, but uh, I guess what happens here after first year is you have a lot of freedom. And kind of looking around the department, people handle that freedom very differently. Some people will go skiing or go on other trips during the week. And sometimes I, I can't tell how much math they actually are doing, uh, but I don't know in, like, I don't know details of everyone's lives. Uh, but I get the feeling there's a wide spectrum of people who will just take random days off and just go have fun after first year. And some people who will like work themselves uh, to death who are always in the building and at 3 a.m. Not that I'm there, but I see people. Uh, me personally, I try and actually treat it like a marathon. So I just kind of like pace myself out every week and say, okay, I'll try and do uh, 15 or 20 hours of research this week, about 10 hours of courses, 10 hours of teaching. And then like, if I feel really good on a day, maybe I'll do a little more research, but uh, I try and keep myself accountable, but always like heading towards the PhD rather than like working myself to death or goofing off too much and never graduating. Would you have done anything differently during your first year and looking back at it? Uh, good question. It's, I, I think uh, third quarter of my first year was really messed up from COVID. And so uh, that was the spring quarter when everything started. Uh, Prior to that, I think uh, I would say that, and you will probably hear this from more than just me, uh, the manifolds sequence has at times a very ridiculous amount of homework. It's not always exceedingly difficult, but to go through and prove all the technical details uh, sometimes would take 20 hours of writing. Uh, and it's just like, uh, I guess the product of how hard some of how, not really hard, but how long some of the problems are. And I guess how messy things get with all the charts and the maps and uh, proving things are smooth with just Jacobians. Oh, so I guess my point there was, I would have considered if whether or not that was the right choice. Uh, at the same time though, I course passed manifolds. So uh, really on the fence on, on that decision. Good point. We didn't talk about course passing versus um, passing the written exams on prelims. Should we give you a little bit of an explanation of our prelim system? So, um, you know, of course, the end goal of the PhD is to set you free with your PhD so that you can be an independent mathematician. And along the way there, in case anybody didn't tell you, mathematicians are hired and fired based on their writing, or at least their communication skills. So we want to make sure you're communicating at the professional level. And so we ask that in the beginning, you know, you put in a fairly intense time into two subjects. You have choices though. You, you, you have to pick two out of three categories to take these exams in. One is um, reels, well, actually analysis. So it's two quarters of reels and then a quarter of complex. The second choice is algebra. And the third choice is geometry topology. Right now it airs more on the side of map, uh, geometry and the manifold side. Um, so you pick two of these subjects and then you can actually, if you've already, some of you have had graduate courses already, so you could come in and try to pass the exams bef in September before you start, or you can take a year long sequence class that builds up to these exams the following September. And um, if you get uh, a high enough grade in each of the three quarters, then you'll just be able to pass out of the exam. 
for one or maybe two of them, depending on how they change the, the policy right now. Um, and then the other way that you pass the exams is that you sit for a written exam that's a timed exam, four to six hours. You know, with COVID, a lot of things have been changing how it's being handled. So I don't know if it'll be four hours or six hours in September, but it'll be something like that. You're usually offered eight problems. There are online examples of 25 years worth of previous problems. The problems are all hard. Uh, they're definitely meant aimed at people who have spent a year long studying, you know, like studied the whole textbook kind of thing. And of course, it's just a sample of what you know, but it's the idea is to motivate you to learn the whole textbook worth of material and have some synergy between all the various chapters. It's not just about one chapter at a time. The whole book is on, on the allowed exam list. And um, so then if you're given eight problems and you have to choose some number of them to do. You don't do them all. Almost nobody does all eight problems. What we say is that if you can get four of them completely correct, you will pass. In truth, there's wiggle room on that. Certainly people have passed with three. Rarely have people passed with just two correct. But the thing to keep in mind is the grading is a little tough. So the problem, the solutions have to be completely correct in the sense that if you fail to prove a case, you won't get a passing grade. If you fail to use the hypothesis, you won't get a passing grade. These are graded on par with the way that a referee report would look in some sense. So if you want to publish a paper in math, it obviously the proof has to be 100% correct. So we're trying to give you some feedback on your writing skills on par with what a professional mathematician would be expected to do. And that's why they're so tough. So it's a bit, a bit of tough love there. Um, not everybody passes the first time, and if you don't pass, it's not the end of the world. You just take it again. Um, we offer a second try in the spring for people who need that, and then since we've changed the exam system, nobody's needed a third try, but I think you certainly could get a third try if you had to. You won't get an infinite number of tries. After some reasonable period of time, um, we, we do occasionally ask people to leave the program in the sense that we will withdraw funding, not not overnight or anything, but with a whole year's worth of notice, a golden handshake kind of thing, that if you're not performing up to the level that we expect, your, your funding will get cut. I just want to make that clear in advance. So you know it doesn't happen very often, but there are times where people have just failed to buckle down and study, you know, or didn't figure out their study skills or got interested in something else or got a job doing something else and we're still trying to stay in grad school. You know, we, we have a lot of people in the department, so there are occasionally a personnel issue comes up. But hopefully that won't happen to you. And if you ever needed help, if you feel like you're sinking, if you feel like you're, it's a struggle, there is a lot of support for this process. We actually, in addition to the year-long sequence with a you know, professor who is a prestigious, you know, in the field kind of professor. We also have somebody who we pay over the summer to be a prelim prep instructor. And all the students who've gone before you are there in the lounge pretty often and ha happy to give advice and support and coaching. And the exams, like we said, are online from previous years. And um, we're changing it all the time to see, you know, how many of the problems are brand new versus how many are come from on the ones that are online. So I think the I think the exams have gotten easier to pass now, but they're still hard. And if I look at the exam problems, to be honest, I, I might not be able to pass any of the exams today, right? Because I'm not studying those particular topics. They're not in my field. So I just want to be honest. They are tough, but they're not too tough. They're, they're meant to be for students like you who are interested in coming in, digging into material. And I do think it's better to really dig in and see how you do at the graduate level for one year and see if you like it. Because maybe you might find that that's just not your thing, you know? And it's better to find out after one year than to be around here for five years and find out you didn't make progress. So it's meant to be a good thing. Not everybody loves the process, I have to say. That's just honest. You know. Other comments on prelims? Does anybody want to chime in? Um, I, uh, speaking of the prelim, I also have some um, question regarding the oral exam, which is sure. the exam that comes after. Is that more like specific in your research area instead of like the broad thing? Exactly. That is once you've got an advisor, you're working on a particular topic, 
it, I think of it as like an oral thesis proposal. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to give a talk, so which is really good for you anyway. You talk on your research. If you've got some theorems already, you would present that. But not everybody does have theorems by the time they go to give the journal exam. It's more a matter of saying, I'm on my way with a clear path how to get to the PhD. You have, oh, to, form, yeah, you have to form your thesis committee at that point, too. So you have to have two other people inside the math department who agree to be on your committee. And we all, everybody at the University of Washington also needs an outside member or somebody who's in another department. And um, they're considered as sort of a witness to the process. They are there to make sure that you're not being abused as a student. And they're also there protecting the university, make sure we're not just handing out PhDs for free. You know, sort of just, um, they don't necessarily have to understand the work that you do at all. Sometimes, you know, we get people, you know, somebody has a friend or something like recently we had somebody from the Spanish department. I'm sure they understood nothing of the thesis but they were a friend of the student. So the, the student gets to pick that person if you know anybody. So it is meant to be a support for you. Thank you. Sure. The general exam, I don't think is so hard. Um, is that, do you, students, do you guys agree? I think, I think it's, it's more of a stepping stone than the prelims, which are hard. Is that right, Kevin Zenching? Do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think normally, uh, depending on the professors, um, like you don't actually need to present something that come out of your own mind. You, but basically you need to just need to demonstrate the, the outlines of your research and then what kind of topics and how much you have learned yet yeah, to the, uh, the committees. I was personally really anxious about the general exam. Uh, but I don't think it was actually as uh, difficult or as scary as uh, it was in my head. Kevin and it turned it turned still, out well. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just last month, right? So it's still fresh on your mind. Yeah. I think the general exam is a really important thing because um, you know once you finish these prelim exams, we don't have much else for you. You're not required. There's not much else that you're required to do. And you, you know, you have four more years of funding to get to the PhD. And if we didn't have some sort of benchmarks in between, um, you might feel actually a little bit lost. Like, what am I doing and why am I doing this if nobody cares? You know, from day to day, you know, there are definitely weeks where I have a conjecture and then it breaks. And then I have a conjecture and then it breaks. And then I finally prove something and I'm writing it up and shoot, and there's a gap in my proof. I mean, doing being a researcher, has its ups and downs, and it's, um, it's kind of nice to get a little bit of outside feedback on the process. Mm -hmm. And also a good thing is that once you pass your, uh, uh, your general exam, your salary will be increased, I mean, $100 per month, I forget. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. And you can apply for a master's degree along the way too, if you don't already have one. And that also helps with the salary. And, and also a quick follow-up question. So um, normally speaking, when do people pick their advisor? That's a good question. So you, you have to pick your advisor, I think by the end of the third year, is that right guys? This is written on the website. But you um, should start, uh, my advice to you is wherever you end up going, start shopping for your advisor right away. You can't really get started on research until you have an advisor. So I have some notes, I have a little um, article on my website on my advice column called How to Get a PhD in a Timely Fashion. And I argue in that paper that the first thing you got to do is get your advisor and uh, and start working, just dig in and start working on any problem. And it doesn't matter if it's your thesis problem or not, dig in on any problem and get started. And that's that's how you'll get going. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you do wanna, when you go to pick an advisor, you do wanna find somebody who you have some synergy with, right? You wanna be able to feel like you can talk to them. You have to be able to make mistakes in front of them. You have to be able to ask dumb questions to them. You have to be able to just feel like you can communicate with them. So it takes a little work sometimes just finding the right personality match. And that's probably far more important than the topic 
is the good personality match. And switching to a little bit different topic, what is the, the gender and ratio and ethnicity makeup of the, the program? And what are some of the outreach or extracurricular activities that people are doing to promote diversity inside the department and in the Seattle area? Uh, that's a big umbrella topic. So we, um, I'm afraid I don't have on my fingertips all of those numbers. I think the gender um, balance in the past had been about 25% identifying as female, 75% identifying as male. But last year we had almost 40% of the incoming class identifying as not male and 60% identifying as male. The um, last year's class, because I was the admissions chair last year too, I know that the numbers better, was 45% international students, 55% American. And um, there's, you know, the African American people are underrepresented, or people of African descent in general are underrepresented in our department, as they are in a lot of places in math. But we do have some in every, you know, last year in particular. But this year, this class, um, among the accepted people, believe it or not, it was close to 50-50 in gender and 9% um, African American, and um, quite a large percentage of Hispanic. And now I forgot the number as well. But I felt really good about the demographics when I looked at it from the point of view of diversity. But it's something, we have a diversity committee, we have a diversity statement, it's something that we're thinking about all the time. I'm not sure we're doing enough in terms of outreach um, locally. The state of Washington um, has a, um, hasn't got the demographics that, you know, if you're in New York City that you could work with. So um, maybe we're not doing enough on that front. But it, we are doing quite a bit of outreach for high school students, for middle school students. So let me just address what we do do. Um, we have a high school summer math camp. We have a middle school aged uh, math circle, which has really been nice. Uh, that's sort of based on the Russian style of teaching math, which has been really important for a lot of the students who've gone through that. My kids were in it for a while, and so it was really fun. Actually, it was really fun when my son in particular would come home and explain something to me that I know that I had taught his teacher in the combinatorics class just a few years before and and it would come back around full circle and nothing was lost in translation. And I thought that was really neat. We also um, have often on and off worked with um, various elementary schools in the area. Some people have gone to the various local prisons and worked in local prisons. So it's something you could get involved in if you want to. It is kind of up to each individual, you know, to figure out how they want to contribute to in terms of outreach. But it's something we very much value in the department. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a couple questions in the chat. Let's address that. So Lauren asks, if you're coming in with a master's degree, does that affect the salary? Yes, it does. If you want to look on our website, there's a code called PDTA1 and uh, it is a few hundred dollars higher than the TA salary. And Brian asks, that's uh, each month actually, and Brian asks, um, if there's time, could we please comment on your experience finding housing and afford affordable housing in the area? So Kevin and Zen Cheng, could you comment on your housing situation? Uh... I would say like yeah. So in in the U UW district, um, the housing a little bit expensive, um, and depends on your preference. I particularly just prefer to live uh, by myself, so I'm living in a, a studio uh, in the U district. Um, so it's a little bit costly. It's a cost like um, fourteen dollars um 1400 per month so i think because i i like to be myself sometimes um you know i work at home and then also you know i think about the problems so um but you can definitely um find the roommates um within the 
tell like the same, especially like after you come in, you can you can chat and you can send email uh, to the department and finding the roommates. And normally, uh, if you have two roommates or one roommate, that you you can have a very comfortable life than just living by yourself. And then I think it will cost like thousand dollars a month if you find a three bedroom or two bedroom apartment with somebody else. Right, Kevin? I don't know. Uh, I have, so I live a bit away from campus since I, it's quieter out here and nicer. Uh, I have one roommate and we each pay 1145. Uh, I know of someone else who I think has two roommates and I think she pays like eight or 900 or that's the last I know of maybe in the past year went up a little bit, but, uh, yeah. And my roommate's also in the PhD program. So uh, it is possible. You do need to budget a little bit. Uh, I I was still paying off a car when I got here, and that was oh, that made it a little harder. But uh, uh, I got enough money for like food to go have fun every now and then, uh, and so forth. That's great. It's not a luxurious lifestyle, but hopefully it's livable. I guess that answered that. Well, maybe we're coming to the end of the questions. It's been a little over an hour, so I don't want to hold you up. Um, I'm happy to linger online, though, if there are other, any other questions. But I'm really glad that you guys could make it. I am hoping that things will work out for you one way or another, and I always like to know what people end up doing. And um, I will be in touch with updates as soon as I can. I, I know it's important. Okay, well, thanks again for coming and um, hope to see you in some way or another soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.